a mechanic from Illinois was called out to tow a crashed vehicle. As he approached the upside-down Ford Ranger, suddenly he was struck with inspiration. Now, most people would only see a wrecked car, but this guy saw a whole new type of vehicle. He then took two pickups, a Ford Ranger and a Ford F-150. Then, he spent six months working on a strange new vehicle. With the two cars combined, he created the illusion that there was only one. With enough room for passengers, it's even legally approved to drive along the road. With the four wheels on top all spinning autonomously in line with the ones on the road, he creates confusion wherever he drives. Yeah, it looks quite weird even when perfectly parked. The importance of eating your greens is something many wholesale companies try to convey to their potential buyers. One company in England called Birdseye went to the next level. And they built a car in the shape of a pea to promote their product. Yeah. It's built on the chassis of an off-road go-kart, and it has many parts from a Volkswagen Beetle. It may look like a toy, but it's not. Equipped with a small Honda engine, this little zooming green pea can even reach 60 miles per hour. Unfortunately, you won't see it anywhere on the road, as its only purpose was for a commercial. But it did gain a lot of fame from ads. Rumor has it, many people even inquired about how they could purchase this weird vehicle. In 1964, a small, lightweight Jeep called the Mini Moke was designed in the US. They offered it to Great Britain with the belief that it would suit their terrain. Still, the car was rejected for its low ground clearance, and the open side doors weren't quite adapted for the English weather. It was further offered to warmer climates in Portugal and Australia. Ooh, yeah. The idea was that it could be used for tourism, and it could be an easy way to travel around. But without any other use for fun activities like four-wheel driving, it lost popularity. Still, with the introduction of electric engines, it's making a comeback. Well, it's no surprise, the clearance now is higher, the seats are more comfortable, oh, yeah. and the price is quite affordable too. The car costs about $21,000. In the early 20th century, cars began to rule the streets. Some of them were steam-powered, but that was far too noisy. There were even electric vehicles, but as they couldn't be powered outside of cities, they also failed to catch on. But there was another, stranger design. In the early 1920s, the Layat Helica was invented. It was also called the plane with no wings. In this car, the driver sits in the front with one passenger seated behind. Yeah. The aerodynamic body of Layat Helica is structured similarly to a plane. It's mostly made from plywood with a large propeller on the front to push the car forwards. The designer believed that all the added weight from normal car parts added unnecessary weight. At the time, steel was incredibly important for other uses, and the lightweight frame was his solution. Weighing about 550 pounds, this vehicle could reach speeds up to 106 miles per hour. That all sounds fantastic, but there was a serious downside. The car was incredibly noisy, and to protect their ears, people had to wear similar headwear as though they were in an actual plane. Not the best choice for a road trip, but surprisingly, 30 of these were sold. With a shortage of fuel in the 1940s, inventors were trying to find alternate forms of transport. The electric vehicles were looked at again after being left on the drawing board for the past 30 years. So, a brand new electric car, Lof Electric, was designed in 1938 and then built in 1942. It's a three-wheeled egg-shaped vehicle with room for only one passenger. This egg on wheels was powered by a battery pack. One full charge was enough for this little egg to travel up to 63 miles. It could ride along the roads at its top speed of 44 miles per hour. This tiny car was also quite lightweight, only about 770 pounds. I wish I had such a car today. It would squeeze into any parking spot. Yeah. Bonus, there were no blind spots in this car with a 270 degree view around it. But unfortunately, it didn't catch on and only one was ever made. German engineering has always been at a high standard with automobiles. And one model, the Amphicar, 
took them to another level. A car that could also be driven into the water and could function as a boat. While driving at modest speeds on the road, the wheels are slightly lower than normal, but once in the water, the front wheels work as rudders. It could sail at a speed of up to seven knots. The designers were aware that it wasn't the best boat or car, so they advertised it as the best boat driven on the road and the best car to sail on water. It was actually pretty decent as a seaworthy vessel. Many people were surprised that there were no leaks, even if left docked for several hours. It grew in popularity and almost 4,000 vehicles were sold in the 1960s. It even inspired several more models of boat cars in the automobile industry. Have you ever wanted to hire a limousine? What if the limo is crossed with a plane? One guy decided he wanted to combine his love for a 727 plane with the ability to drive it on the road. First, he found a plane. Then he removed the wings and the tail from the body and attached the plane's body to a Mercedes-Benz bus. So, it's kinda a regular bus in a plane's disguise. Stretched at 52 feet, it became the biggest limousine in the world. There's enough room for 40 people, but it can still drive at up to 124 miles per hour. The cockpit is mostly preserved. However, a steering wheel was replaced to drive the limo, for obvious reasons. The original folding staircase still works, making it a nice welcome to passengers while boarding the Boeing limo. Ooh. Surprisingly, it's registered to be driven on the road, and you can even rent this 24,000-pound limousine. At the beginning of the 20th century, car engines became a lot more efficient, and the availability of affordable gas helped automobiles really kick off. Back in 1927, car designers invented something really posh. Meet Bugatti Royale. It was the most luxurious car ever made. At 21 feet long and weighing 7,000 pounds, almost twice the average weight of a sedan built today. However, at the time of its creation, there was a great decline in the economies around the world. Unfortunately, this lavish car wasn't a success. Even the royalty of Europe had no interest in such an extravagant purchase. 25 had been planned to be made, but as interest faded, only three were sold. The production line ceased with only seven built in the end. The engine design was based on a French aircraft engine and is the largest ever built. But following the failure of the Bugatti Royale, the remaining engines were reused for newly built high-speed rail cars for the French railway system. In 1930, an inventor, John Archibald Purvis, created something he believed will be the high-speed vehicle of the future. He got his inspiration from designs made by Leonardo da Vinci. John felt that the brilliant man was onto something. He then created the Dynosphere a mono-wheeled vehicle that ran on electricity. This 10 feet high singular wheel made from lattice iron and covered in leather weighed around 1,000 pounds. The driver's seat and the motor are connected and mounted on wheels. At first, steering was only possible when the driver leaned to either side, but later a steering wheel was implemented to make it easier. It could reach up to 30 miles per hour. There was some interest in it as a fun activity for the beach, Ah, and a modified version with eight seats was also made. But unfortunately, the designer's vision of giant wheels covering the highways instead of cars didn't come true. Probably because he has yet to find a way to stop it from moving, other than running into something. No need to reinvent the wheel, they say. Funnily, it's been recently reinvented. There's a bicycle with square wheels. And it's not a modern art object stored in a fancy museum, nope. It's a totally functioning, everyday means of transportation. And yeah, it goes smoothly. Here's a secret behind this weird bike you gotta know. These square wheels don't actually rotate. Take a closer look at their design. The outside of the wheel is fitted with a track. And it's that track that moves around the entire frame, not the wheel. So, as the rider pedals, the track moves and rotates around the frame. It reminds me of a treadmill, and technically, both the treadmill and these square wheels work pretty much in the same way. Well, this invention looks pretty safe, I guess. 
Now look at this weird U-shaped robot. What do you think it's made for? A new toothbrush designed by a French company called Y-Brush claims to thoroughly clean teeth. Well, it does save a bit of time. Usually, the dentists say that you have to clean your teeth for about two minutes twice a day. This device can clean all of your teeth in only 10 seconds. The toothbrush, which was first introduced at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2017 and is now available on Amazon for U.S. customers, features 35,000 soft nylon filaments that brush all teeth simultaneously at a 45-degree angle. While the American Dental Association recommends brushing teeth twice a day for two minutes using a soft bristle toothbrush, the Y brush was developed with the assistance of dentists over four years and is available in adult and kid sizes. It's not that easy to change the color of your car. It takes a lot of time, effort, and expertise to do that. But it seems like soon it won't be an issue any longer. Meet a color-changing car. Do you want it blue today? No problem. Maybe you prefer red. Easy peasy. About a year ago, BMW presented a concept, but they went from a monochromatic concept to a veritable rainbow of various shades and tints in just a year. Check out this electric sports sedan concept. It's called iVision D, and it's like a sneak peek into the future with all sorts of cool tech, like virtual assistants powered by AI and heads-up displays on the windshield. And get this, they even threw in a full-color version of e-ink technology, something we've never seen before from last year's concept. How rad is that? So, there are some smart folks over at the University of California, San Diego, who are working on a cool new wearable device. This gadget can actually generate a bit of electricity from the sweat on your fingertips. And get this, it even works while you're dozing off. The way it works is by touching objects with your fingertips, like typing on your phone or playing the piano. Apparently, doing these things can help produce more energy. After some testing, the engineers found that wearing the gadget for 10 hours while snoozing can generate enough juice to power an electronic watch for a full day. That's about 400 millijoules of energy, in case you were wondering. Pretty neat, huh? Did you know that around 3 million people in the UK, and millions more worldwide, are affected by color blindness? Crazy, right? It's more common in guys, with 1 in 12 males being affected. But it still affects 1 in 200 women, too. Basically, color blindness happens because of how our brains process visual information and how our retinal cone cells react to light. It makes it tough to tell the difference between colors because they all kind of blend together. But fear not. After over a decade of research and testing, the amazing Enchroma sunglasses were created. These glasses have lenses that filter out specific light wavelengths, which helps fix the overlap issue. So now, people with color blindness can finally see the world in all its colorful glory. I gotta say, this invention is cool. But recently, even cooler glasses have been invented. They were created by some brilliant researchers at Oxford University to help people who are blind or have limited vision. These glasses for augmented reality are designed to provide wearers with helpful information about their surroundings so they can confidently navigate their daily lives. It's amazing how this technology can give people a whole new perspective on the world and help them experience life to the fullest. We all know that plastic waste is a major problem. It's messing with marine life and our environment in all sorts of ways once it gets into the ocean. But check this out. Scientists from the University of Chemistry and Technology in Prague are trying to fix it with self-propelling microbots. These little guys are about the size of a red blood cell, and they use solar energy to move around and chow down on microplastics. It's like a sci-fi movie coming to life. And get this, they're actually making a difference. You can see them zipping around in this pic with the blue spots representing the microbots. The dangerous plastics are getting broken down and the environment is getting cleaned up using visible light. 
Unlike all the previous ideas mentioned in this video, this one gained neither success nor recognition. Back in the day, dudes were all about the walrus mustache and beard combo. But then, like most trends, it faded away. Suddenly, it was totally cool to be clean shaven. But let's be real, who has time for that kind of morning routine? That's why hitting up the local barber for a quick shave and shoe shine became the norm. The only problem? Barbers could only serve one customer at a time. So, some genius came up with the idea of a group shaving machine. Picture this, a row of dudes sitting side by side with the machine applying foam to all their faces at once. Then, a giant blade would come in and trim all their facial hair in one fell swoop. In theory, this bad boy could shave 12 dudes at a time. But, as with most things in life, there were some downsides. The machine couldn't adjust to different face shapes, so some guys ended up with uneven shaves. And the worst case scenario? Cuts and abrasions from that giant blade. Ouch. One more mustache-related invention. Back in the Victorian era, men were serious about their appearance. A proper gentleman knew that a well-groomed mustache was the key to success. But with great facial hair comes great responsibility. How could a man protect his prized possession from hot or frothy drinks? A man could use the mustache cup, invented by a British potter named Harvey Adams. But that wasn't enough for Reuben P. Hollinshed, who patented an even better invention in 1890, a mustache guard that suspended a gentleman's mustache out of harm's way while he ate and drank. It may look a bit painful, but hey, anything for the perfect stash. The tipping culture varies from country to country. In the USA, it's extremely rude not to tip while in Japan, it's extremely rude to tip. How crazy is that, huh? But did you know that in the 50s, there was an automated tip requester invented? I wonder how they advertised it. It probably was something like, Introducing the ultimate invention for all the lazy hotel bellhops out there, the automatic tip requester. Now you won't have to grimace in case you're not satisfied with the tips. The machine will do it for you. Okay, jokes aside, let's dive into its history. It was by an amateur inventor named Russell E. Oakes. The device itself comes equipped with an artificial hand and cash box, and can be strapped around your waist for maximum convenience. And if a guest's tip isn't up to snuff, no worries. Just flash the no sales sign and move on to the next sucker. Who needs human interaction when you've got a robotic money grabber on your side? The plane had been in the air for a mere 25 seconds when the pilots noticed weird noises and bizarre vibrations. They tried several ways to improve the situation, but nothing worked. The engine surges continued, and just over a minute into the flight, when the plane reached 3,000 feet, both engines failed. First the right one, two seconds later the left one. The pilots decided to return to the airport they had just left. At the same time, they tried to restart the engines. Nothing seemed to work. The flight crew made a decision to pitch the plane down and then level it off. Perhaps it could help them gain some speed for the glide. But soon, they realized they wouldn't make it to the airport. Was the plane going to crash? That's when the miracle at Gotrura occurred. The morning before the flight started as usual. Regular pre-flight procedures, good weather. The members of the flight crew were experienced pilots. A 44-year-old Danish captain with over 8,000 flight hours under his belt and a 34-year-old first officer from Sweden with 3,000 hours. So, what could go wrong? The plane itself was almost brand new. It was a McDonnell Douglas MD-81 nicknamed Dana Viking. It made its first flight on March 16, 1991. By that fateful day, the aircraft had been in service for a mere nine months. There were 122 passengers and seven crew members on board. Flight 751 Scandinavian Airlines was a scheduled flight from Stockholm, Sweden to Warsaw, Poland. On the way, the plane was supposed to make a stop in Copenhagen, Denmark. The aircraft took off from Stockholm according to its schedule at 8.47 a.m. local time. But by that point, 
the people inside had already been doomed, all because of a terrible sequence of events before the departure. It started the night before. The plane arrived at Stockholm Airport after a flight from Zurich. It was 10.09 p.m. The aircraft spent the night at the gate outside. It was cold. The temperature dropped to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. What made the situation even worse was that almost 6,000 pounds of freezing cold fuel, chilled during the night, still remained in the tanks located in the wings. The fuel was so cold because the plane had been flying at the cruising altitude, where the air temperature outside the cabin varied from minus 61 to minus 80 degrees. The flight from Zurich lasted around 1 hour and 40 minutes. Soon after midnight, a flight technician came to check on the aircraft. The man had to remove some slush from the landing gear, otherwise he wouldn't be able to examine it. At around 2 a.m., when he was leaving, he noticed some ice covering the upper part of the wings. By the morning, the situation had become even dire. A layer of clear, almost invisible ice had formed on the tops of the wings. The plane had to leave the gate at around 8.30 a.m. An hour before the departure, the mechanic responsible for the plane noticed that some ice covered the underside of the wings. He decided to make sure there was no ice on the tops of the wings. He climbed a ladder and put one knee on the wing. Then he bent forward to touch the front part of the wing. There was no ice, just some slush. The mechanic decided to make sure everything was fine with the air inlet of one of the engines. He didn't find anything abnormal. Soon after that, the personnel used more than 220 gallons of de-icing fuel to remove ice from the plane. The mechanic consulted with the captain of the aircraft and ordered the staff to de-ice the underside of the wings as well. After all, he had seen some ice there. But no one thought to double-check if there was clear ice on the tops of the wings. After they had finished the procedure, the mechanic reported to the captain, uh, We're done here. The icing finished. There was a lot of snow and ice, but everything's clear now. The captain thanked the mechanic and carried on with the pre-flight procedures. The plane taxied to the runway. Its engine's anti-ice systems were switched on and didn't show any malfunction. But several passengers later claimed they had seen ice sliding off the upper side of the wings while the plane had been taking off. And still, the plane left the ground and headed for Stockholm as usual. But shortly after the takeoff, several pieces of the overlooked ice broke off. At full speed, they slammed into the fans of the engines near the tail on both sides of the plane, ruining the blades. It led to a series of surges, and the rest is history. Meanwhile, somewhere in the cabin, Scandinavian Airlines flight captain Per Holmberg, who was on board as a passenger, noticed something was amiss. At first, he informed the flight attendant sitting in the rear jump seat that the right engine was surging. She tried to contact the flight crew, unsuccessfully. Then, the ununiformed captain rushed to the cockpit and asked if he could help the pilots. The first officer gave him the emergency checklist, and the captain asked him to start the auxiliary power unit, a small gas turbine in the tail of the plane. Holmberg's advice and help were invaluable. But was it enough to save the plane and the people inside? When the plane emerged from the cloud cover at an altitude of 890 feet, the pilots realized they wouldn't have enough time to make it back to the airport. An immediate emergency landing was unavoidable. The assisting captain passed the order to the cabin crew, and they started preparing the passengers. There was a large field to the north of the plane, but the captain realized they didn't have enough time to reach it. So he chose a much smaller field in a forested area in the direction of flight. It was not far from the village of Gotrura in upland Sweden. The plane was just 1,300 feet above the ground when the assisting captain started extending the flaps. At a height of 183 feet, the captain reported to Stockholm Control, We're crashing to the ground! Seven seconds later, the plane hit several trees and lost a huge chunk of its right wing. By that time, the landing gear had already been extended and the speed had decreased to 139 miles per hour. Moments later, the plane's tail struck the ground and broke off. 
The aircraft kept sliding across the field, still at high speed. It traveled 360 feet, with its main landing gear leaving marks on the field. At one point, the plane lost the main and nose landing gear. Its fuselage broke into three parts. Miraculously, there was no fire. If you look at the pictures from the crash site, the plane torn into pieces, with its parts scattered across the field, it's hard to believe that all 129 people on board the plane survived. It seems like a miracle. But it was also thanks to the flight attendant's quick reaction and the correct instructions they gave the passengers. They didn't panic and told the people to adopt the brace position just in time to avoid fatalities. Even more surprising, almost all passengers, except for four people, made their way out of the plane on their own. No wonder this accident was nicknamed the Miracle. The aircraft, though, wasn't as lucky. The nine-month-old plane was damaged so badly that it was an immediate write-off. Everyone praised the actions of the flight crew. The landing was incredibly skilled, especially in such a fast-developing, very dangerous situation. The captain himself admitted that few pilots were ever forced to put to the test the skills they got during training, at least not to this degree. He said he was proud of his crew and relieved that everyone had survived. And he never returned to piloting commercial planes. Did you know that animals see the world differently from us? Take this. Pigeons actually have better vision than humans. Crazy, right? So let's try to see the world from the animal's eyes. Let's start with snakes. Their way of seeing the world is totally different from ours. They have special infrared sensitive receptors in their snouts. This allows them to see the radiated heat of warm blooded mammals. Now let's move on to cows. These big guys don't see colors as well as humans do. They can't see the color red because they don't have the necessary receptors in their retinas for that. So they only perceive variations of blue and green. Also, they don't like it when someone approaches them from behind. They have a near panoramic vision, and the only area they can't see is directly to the back. So if you're ever sneaking up on a cow, make sure you give them a heads up. Horses have a blind spot right in front of their faces because of their eye placement. This means they can't see things directly in front of them. Also, they don't see as many colors as we do. Just like cows, their world is mostly made up of greens, yellows, and blues. Poor guys. Fish eyes have ultraviolet receptors and a more spherical lens than humans. This gives them an almost 360 degree vision. As for colors, they're able to see all the same ones as we humans do. But because light behaves differently underwater, they have a hard time discerning red and its shades. Deep sea fish can easily see in the dark, which is pretty cool. Sharks, on the other hand, can't distinguish colors at all, but they see much clearer under the water than we do. Birds have some pretty unique ways of seeing the world. Unlike humans, birds can see ultraviolet light. This helps them differentiate between males and females of their own species, as well as better navigate in their surroundings. Also, they are very good at focusing. For example, falcons and eagles can focus on a small mouse in the field up to a distance of one mile. A pigeon can see all the tiny details, so if you ever need to find a crack in the pavement, just ask a pigeon. And by the way, it has a 340 degree field of vision, and generally their vision is considered twice as good as a human's. There you have it. I'm envious of a pigeon. Insects have some weird vision patterns too. Flies, for example, have thousands of little eye receptors that work together to give them a big picture of what's going on around them. And get this, they see everything in slow-mo. Plus, they can see ultraviolet light. It helps them with communication. Bees have their own problems. These guys can't tell what the color red is. To them, it looks like a dark blue. How messed up is that? Now, rats. These little guys can't see red either, but that's not the weirdest part. Either of their eyes moves on its own, so they're seeing double like all the time. It's a wonder they don't run into more walls, am I right? Cats don't see shades of red or green, but they do see brown, yellow, and blue hues like a boss. Plus, they got a wide-angle view, so they can peep more stuff on the sides than we can. There's more, though. When it's pitch black outside, cats become ninja-like and can see six times better than us. Their pupils adjust to any lighting like magic. Now let's talk about dogs. These furry friends can't see red or orange, but they do rock at blue and violet. 
Plus, they can differentiate 40 shades of gray. I mean, it's not 50, but still impressive. On a related note, frogs are really picky eaters. They won't even bother with food that isn't moving. They could be surrounded by a buffet of delicious bugs, but if they don't wiggle, frogs won't even bat an eye, and they're not the most observant creatures either. If something isn't important to them, like a shadow, they won't even bother looking at it. Chameleons have eyes that can move independently of each other, so they can see everything around them without even turning their heads. They can even see two images at the same time, like a double feature movie, one in front and one behind. Pretty impressive, right? What would you do if you suddenly got 360 degree vision like a chameleon? Share in the comments. Now, if you could get into a time machine and travel back to 1969, you'd see something spectacular. What you're looking at isn't some random desert. It's one of the most powerful waterfalls, completely dry. In the summer and fall of 1969, the American side of Niagara Falls stayed without water. It lasted six months. Researchers wanted to study the rock face of the falls. They were afraid it was going to become too unstable because of erosion. Erosion is the process when natural forces, such as water and wind, wear away earthen materials. For example, if you see glacial ice become muddy, it means erosion is happening. Three waterfalls that cross the international border between Canada and the United States together make something we know as the magnificent Niagara Falls. The three waterfalls are the Horseshoe Falls, the American Falls, and the Bridal Veil Falls, in order from largest to smallest. The American Falls are fully on the American side, while the Horseshoe Falls are primarily on the Canadian side, divided by Goat Island. The Bridal Veil Falls, the smallest of them all, are on the American side, but separated from the others by Luna Island. Don't America and Canada have a cool natural border? Many didn't believe we could actually go against wild nature and stop such insane amounts of water from flowing. But we did it! It took a 600-foot dam across the enormous Niagara River to really shut down these astonishing falls. This means they had to divert 60,000 gallons of water every second so that the remaining flow traveled over the biggest horseshoe falls. Yup, the ones that are completely on the Canadian side of the border. Over 27,000 tons of rock were used to construct that dam. And more than 1,000 trucks carried that rock back in the hot summer of 69. On June 12, the American Falls stopped after their continuous flow for more than 12,000 years. So the Horseshoe Falls then took the extra flow and absorbed it so that research could be done. But the locals were still worried. They knew it wasn't possible to control such amounts of water. They were afraid the water might take a different route and cause a catastrophic flood. They were worried the tourists wouldn't come anymore if teams didn't manage to make the waterfall flow again the way it used to. But tourists kept coming even that summer, and they got a unique chance to see something no one had ever seen before or after. During that period, there was even a temporary walkway built only 20 feet away from the edge of the now-dry falls. It helped workers to clean the bottom of what used to be a river. So tourists could go there and explore the wild landscape of the falls that was usually under the water, hostile, and not accessible to visitors at all. As they were exploring the dried bottom of the falls, researchers stumbled upon millions of different coins people had thrown in the water over decades, maybe to make a wish or for some other purpose. Wow, a Niagara Falls piggy bank! Well, they removed most of those coins. I wonder who got them. But in the past couple of decades, more and more tourists have been coming here. Imagine all the things they could find now. More coins, of course, but also lost cameras, errant drones, cell phones, and other things careless visitors could accidentally drop in the waterfalls. The idea of removing all the water and turning Niagara Falls into a desert proved to be possible. But it may need to be done again. In 2020, the media reported that two pedestrian bridges in Niagara Falls needed to be either replaced or repaired. No wonder, since they're almost 120 years old. These bridges are located above the rapids. Experts discuss whether they should divert the water once again or not. People talk about Niagara Falls a lot, and some believe they're among the tallest waterfalls in the world. But the truth is, they're not. They're famous, precious, and breathtaking. But when it comes to height, there are nearly 500 other waterfalls across the globe that are taller than Niagara. Let's take Angel Falls in Venezuela, for example. 
They're more than 3,000 feet tall. But what makes Niagara Falls so special, among other waterfalls, is the amount of water that flows over them. Very high waterfalls don't usually have great amounts of water. The combination of all those huge amounts of water and the height is what makes Niagara Falls so breathtaking. Also, they might be some of the fastest-moving waterfalls on our planet. The Niagara River appeared after the last ice age, together with the whole Great Lakes Basin. The Niagara River is part of it. 18,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, this awesome waterfall didn't exist. Ice sheets covered the area of southern Ontario. They were 1 to 2 miles thick. As the ice sheets were moving southward, they created the basin of the Great Lakes. Then they melted, releasing enormous amounts of water into the basins. Generally, the water we drink is fossil water. Only 1% of it renews through the year, with the remaining 99% coming from ice sheets. The Niagara Peninsula hasn't been beneath the ice for nearly 12,500 years. As the ice melted, the resulting water started to flow down through what later turned into Niagara River, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. It took a lot of time, but the water eventually eroded cliffs and formed these spectacular falls. Now, you might have noticed that the Niagara River is amazingly green. This specific color tells us how powerful the water is when it comes to erosion. Every minute, Niagara Falls spews over 60 tons of dissolved minerals. All that, together with dissolved salt and finely ground rock, makes the color so magnificent. People who live in the United States and Canada, or more precisely, over a million people who have access to the area, use the waters of Niagara River for different purposes. For example, fishing, getting drinking water, doing recreational activities, including swimming, boating, and bird watching, producing hydroelectric power, and so much more. Now, the first hydroelectric generating station in the world was built at the end of the 19th century, and it was right next to the falls. Pretty soon, it started paying off because people were getting electricity from it. But this electricity could travel only 300 feet, so something needed to be improved there. Nikola Tesla was the one who took up the challenge and made the necessary changes. He discovered that electricity could travel long distances if an alternating current was used. Today, several Niagara Falls power plants provide over 2 million kilowatts of power. Okay, I'll tell you another interesting thing. 1969 wasn't the only time when Niagara Falls stopped. Back in 1848, the water didn't flow over the falls for up to 40 hours. Now, the falls were already very popular among tourists and a useful source of energy for local people. So, no wonder they freaked out. Nature was to blame this time. Ice blocked the source of the Niagara River. An American farmer was the first one to notice it. It was March 29th, and he went for a walk right before midnight. Soon, he realized he couldn't hear the powerful roar of the falls. He quickly went to the edge of the river and stood there in shock. There was hardly any water. Factories and mills had to shut down because they depended on that water. Turtles were just wandering around. Fish didn't survive. Some people took a walk on the river bottom, taking little things they could find there as souvenirs. But two days later, on March 31st, people heard a distant rumbling coming from upriver. It was getting nearer and louder until a wall of water appeared in front of their eyes. And one of the world's greatest attractions that millions of tourists visit every year was back in business again. Magnificent and, in the end, invincible. As it should be. Let's face it, as stars go, our sun is actually, well, pretty boring. Come on, there's nothing unusual about it. There are millions of similar yellow dwarfs in the universe. And yet, we love it. After all, it's the only star we have, and it gives us life. However, it wasn't always like that. Once upon a time, the sun had a twin, possibly an evil one. Hmm, <laughs> what happened to it? Well, let's find out. Now this here is a giant molecular cloud. They're also sometimes called dark nebula. Here, there are many interstellar clumps full of gas, dust, and piles of stars. These clouds have no clear boundaries and often take weird, crazy forms. You can even see some of them with the naked eye. Look at the clear sky at night. They look like dark spots all across the bright Milky Way. And this is exactly where our sun was born about 4.5 billion years ago. The sun originated from one of these molecular clouds. Billions of years ago, waves of energy were passing by here. They collected all this material and compressed these clumps into dense nuclei. 
That's when a protostar was born. This young protostar was a ball of lukewarm hydrogen and helium. And then, millions of years later, the temperature and pressure inside the balls increased. As a result, a star was born. The Sun. But not everything in this molecular cloud has turned into the Sun. The remaining materials began to revolve around the new star. And, as you might have guessed, they gradually turned into planets, including our Earth. This is how our solar system was created. But it's quite possible that this is not the whole story, and that at the same time, along with our star, another one was born. The lost twin of the Sun, made from the same materials under the same conditions. But why do we think that it exists? Well, recently, scientists have launched some statistical models to find out more about the birth of stars. And these models have shown that many stars appear not individually, but in clusters, or at least with one sibling. After more research, scientists confirmed that, yep, most stars formed inside molecular clouds are born with a companion. Sometimes these companions stay together. For example, a small star will revolve around a large one. They can even form double, triple, and other star systems. And sometimes, their paths may diverge forever. This probably happened to our Sun as well. It could have had a sibling too. Perhaps not even one, but a whole cluster of little brothers and sisters. And one bigger twin with a similar mass and other characteristics. But if that's the case, then where are you, our lost twin? Well, we have one hypothesis. And according to it, this twin may not be as good as it seems. In the 1980s, scientists began to notice a certain pattern in the Earth's history. Approximately every 27 million years, give or take, large-scale extinctions occurred on our planet. Pretty strange, right? Every 27 million years in the history of Earth, some kind of catastrophe occurred that changed its biosphere forever, as if something, as scheduled, cyclically, caused them. Then an astronomer, Richard Muller, suggested that there may be something that caused the events, a certain celestial body. According to him, it could be a dwarf star that we can't see because of how dim it is. It could be located about one and a half light years away from us. This star rotates around the Sun in a huge orbit, and it approximately takes a whopping 27 million years for it to finish its orbit. And when it gets closest to the Sun, it starts to cause complete chaos. While approaching us, this troublemaker changes the trajectories of comets in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt. As a result, all these comets start to rush straight toward us. Then they crash into the Earth and cause mass extinctions, just like it was with dinosaurs. This hypothetical star was named Nemesis. It's the name of the ancient Greek deity of retribution. What is it taking revenge on us for? No idea. Perhaps it didn't like the fact that, once upon a time, the Sun took away almost all the dust and gas from a molecular cloud. The Sun became a fairly large star, but the twin remained dark and small. Moreover, in the end, it was forced to fly away in the middle of nowhere. Anyone would be annoyed by something like this. Scientists have put forward various hypotheses about what the mysterious nemesis is. Perhaps it's a brown or red dwarf. The remnants of a star that has completely depleted its fuel. Or maybe it's not a star at all, but a rogue planet more gigantic than Jupiter. Well, whatever it is, its existence isn't particularly pleasant for us. However, all our attempts to find the culprit, unfortunately, fail. At the moment, we still haven't found any signs of Nemesis. Recent studies have called into question the theory of regular mass extinctions. If you look more into fossil records, you'll notice that these catastrophes occurred rather randomly, rather than on a clear schedule. Now scientists doubt if Nemesis may actually exist. They also say that any star moving in a similar orbit would be very unstable, and it's very unlikely that it could have survived for that long. But despite the lack of clear evidence, Nemesis had become quite famous online. Many articles and news still mention it in different contexts. They like to write off any dramatic events taking place in the world, like asteroid falls, tsunamis, and so on, on this mysterious star. So now, all this may seem like a typical urban legend. But let's not forget about something important. Even if Nemesis itself doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that the Sun didn't have a twin. 
First of all, everything we talked about at the beginning is still relevant. Most stars aren't born alone. The probability that our Sun also had a sibling is still very high. Secondly, there may be evidence of the existence of this lost twin, and is probably somewhere in the Oort cloud. This is a huge cloud in the outer limits of our solar system. It consists of a bunch of comets and other cool rocks. Now, scientists believe that this cloud stores various remnants and fragments of everything that remained after the birth of our solar system. It's like a huge museum of our past. So, in this Oort cloud, scientists have noticed something interesting. Basically, this region seems to be too heavy. What the Oort cloud actually looks like doesn't correspond to our current models of the formation of the solar system. It's too heavy because there are some remnants of something in it. So there used to be something in the solar system that we don't know about yet. But when scientists included a possible second sun in their calculations, it fit just right. Like a missing piece of a puzzle, the lost twin perfectly matches the gap in the weight of the Oort cloud. So yeah, the sun almost certainly had a twin. But what happened to it? And where is it now? Unfortunately, this star is most likely already very far away. Probably after their birth, the son and daughter, <laughs> okay, son 2.0, spent only a couple of million years together, and then they had to separate completely. Now, the second twin may be hundreds of light years away from us. It can be anywhere in the Milky Way. And yeah, theoretically, we could find it, but that would be quite difficult. To do this, we need to find all the stars similar to our Sun, about the same age, all over the Milky Way galaxy. And even if we make a list of these stars, what's next? We have no way of knowing which one was really the twin of the Sun. So the lost twin will most likely remain lost, and our Sun will remain forever lonely. Ah, oh, what a sad story. But cheer up, for us it's probably the best. If we had two suns, perhaps the solar system would never have become what it is now. Our planet might not exist at all, and that means that there might be no life. So we probably should be grateful for the sun sacrifice. On the other hand, our sunsets would look like the ones they have on Tatooine. Cool. Flies are everywhere we go, literally. It's believed that flies originated in Asia. But these days, they live everywhere people live, only excluding Antarctica and maybe a couple of islands. Flies have traveled the oceans following humans, but they never go anywhere alone. In the wilderness and deserts where humans are absent, you won't find any flies. We know them well, but we all have that unanswered question about flies. Why do flies rub their limbs? Turns out, they just clean them. It's this simple. A fly has hair all over its body. The hairs on the limbs serve as detectors for flying, finding food, and doing whatever else the fly business is. They have to keep their limbs clean at all times. So they just rub them every time they get a chance. Their limbs are sensitive and they serve more than one purpose. Apparently, the limbs have taste receptors so the flies can taste with their feet. They can land on their potential meal and wander around it, giving it a good taste before consuming it. Flies can't chew, so they're on an all-liquid diet and drink their food. If the food they have picked as their next meal is solid, they have a special ritual to make it edible. A fly regurgitates digestive juices on their soon-to-be food, and those juices break it into the smallest pieces that can be drunk. Also, spitting out those juices frees up space in their stomachs for new food. Quite often, flies sit on our food. They can appear harmless, but it's not exactly true. First, remember that they spill out those juices onto your food, which is already gross enough. But there's more. You have to keep in mind that flies land everywhere, and it's not always flowers, but all the gross stuff as well. And flies especially like that said gross stuff like rotting foods, dumpsters, and even worse. So, their limbs collect all the germs and microbes from those places. When a fly lands on your food, it transfers those germs to your meal. Some of the microbes they transfer can even cause diseases like cholera and typhoid. There was even an experiment once made to demonstrate how it works. There were two bulls, 
one contained a red powder of some kind of spice and the other bowl had white rice in it. Flies were let in and they would migrate from the spice bowl to the rice bowl and back. Soon enough, rice got covered with red spice. Now replace harmless spice with something grosser and rice with your dinner. So you should always cover your food to make sure some fly doesn't take a walk on it and step and spit all over it. If you're eating, make sure you swat them away. But don't worry if some annoying fly manages to sit on your sandwich for a second before you kick it out. No need to throw the sandwich out. If you act it fast, then you're safe. Also, experts say that an average healthy human has a strong enough immune system to repel parasites. Even though flies are gross and annoying, bugging around and tickling you with their limbs, they do serve some good. They're responsible for pollinating flowers. They collect nectar from them, which gets stuck to their hair on their bodies. And then they pollinate the next flower when landing on it. Also, if flies didn't exist, our planet would be even dirtier. Flies recycle some of the human waste. Flies are also an important part of the ecosystem since they're food for birds, spiders, lizards, frogs, and many more. Without flies, they'd all go extinct. Apart from flies having the superpower of tasting with their feet, there are other interesting facts about them too. They can walk on both horizontal and vertical surfaces and even upside down. They can do it because each one of a fly's feet has two pads with tiny hair. And those hairs produce a glue-like substance that allows flies to have an excellent grip. Flies have unique eyes, which have a large complex of 3,000 to 6,000 simpler eyes within each of the two compound eyes. A fly's eyes don't move, but its vision is nearly 360 degrees. They can see behind their back. So, wherever you are, a fly definitely sees you and every other danger with one or a few of their thousands of monitors. In addition to the two compound eyes, flies also have three simple eyes located on their foreheads, which serve as a compass and allow a fly to navigate. They also have an amazing reaction time. Ever wondered why it's so hard to swat a fly? Well, to a fly, we're sloths. That's because they see things in slow motion compared to us. Species have different perceptions of speed. The speed we see will be twice faster for a turtle, and it will be four times slower for a fly. Turn a video on at 0.25 times speed and imagine someone approaching you with this speed. Well, that's how a fly sees you. So yes, it has enough time to escape. A fly has just one set of wings. But in addition to their pair of wings, they also have so-called halters, which allow them to take off fast. Millions of years ago, halters were serving as a second pair of wings. Now they help to take off and also to balance the air. If a fly loses one of the halters, it'll start flying in circles. And if both of them go missing, it won't be able to fly anymore at all. Also, even though their wings beat up to 1,000 times per minute, they're also very slow flyers, only reaching the speed of 4.5 miles per hour. If a fly lives in an urban area with enough people and garbage around, it doesn't fly far away from the place of residence, only having a territory of a bit over 3,200 feet. Rural flies are far more explorative, and they can fly away up to 7 miles at a time. A fly doesn't live long. Its lifetime is just around 30 days. But during this time, they lay from 500 to 800 eggs each on average. But it's not 1,000 at once. It's several goes throughout their life. With 75 to 100 eggs at once, the eggs hatch within 24 hours. And it takes a week in total for an egg to turn into a grown fly. And then the cycle continues. In colder climates, this process can take twice as long. A timber fly is the biggest fly species, which lives in Central and South America. They can grow up to 3.15 inches. Also, flies have beds, or more like their favorite spot to stay and sleep. They have a comfy place, somewhere close to their source of food, and they come there to rest at night. If you ever had your house flooded with flies, 
Here are a few tips for you to reduce their population. First, it's important to understand what they're attracted to. They're attracted to other flies and even to the smell of flies living there. And flies have an amazing sense of smell. So if you hosted even one fly, expect to get more guests. If you have any traces of flies, like fly specks, they'll find you too. Make sure to wash your walls and surfaces. Next, flies love garbage and rotting produce. They lay eggs in rotten food and meat, so make sure to keep your food in the fridge, cover it, and keep the trash in tightly sealed containers. And of course, take out the trash regularly. Flies have a sweet tooth, or more like a sweet foot, since they taste with their feet. And they love syrup and other sugary liquids. They're also fond of soda and vinegar. So make sure to keep those stored and always wipe after yourself if you spill something. Lastly, they like to hide and live in dirty and leaky drains. They eat the bacteria from there. So always clear your drains and repair any leaks right away. Also, it'll help to seal all the cracks in your floor, ceiling, and walls if you have any. That's one of their ways to get into the house. Did you ever notice that the toilet paper color is usually white? But this color wasn't always a favorite. In fact, colored toilet papers popped out on the shelves in the 1950s. Homeowners purchased pink, blue, yellow, green, and even black paper because these colors matched the interior. But eventually, many doctors began to associate the dye in colored toilet papers with increased health risks. Also, the dye didn't allow the colored paper to decompose as quickly when it was flushed down, which increased the risk of clogging septic tanks. This made manufacturing and retail prices too high compared to the basic white paper, and eventually, the demand began to fall. And now, let's take a closer look at these fancy patterns. Most people probably don't care about the decorations when it comes to their toilet paper. However, these patterns still exist. But why? Well, there are several opinions. Some say it's just a marketing tool. Manufacturers use pretty decor to make their products look more aesthetically pleasing and to make customers associate their brand with elegance and a luxurious lifestyle. Another explanation is more practical. These patterns fluff up the paper, which makes it more absorbent. Speaking of fluffiness, have you ever wondered why they have such rough toilet paper in public toilets? The most obvious answer is that high-quality toilet paper is more expensive. Also, companies prefer purchasing giant rolls of low-quality paper because they can change them less frequently. This decision also helps prevent stealing. Yes, people actually steal paper from public toilets. Have you ever noticed that light switches in public toilets are usually placed outside? Well, it's not a coincidence. Construction companies do it for safety reasons because, as we all know, electricity plus water is a dangerous combination. And light switches are connected to power. Therefore, electricity literally flows through them. Of course, professionally installed switches will have a bunch of additional safety precautions. But most builders prefer not to take risks. The UK has far stricter rules for light switch safety compared to the US. That's why if you live in London, you'll probably find light switches outside the bathroom more commonly. But don't worry, most bathrooms in the US feature independent electrical circuits. This provides additional safety in case of accidental electric shock. When any change in the electrical current happens, they should shut off automatically. There are so many awesome lighting opportunities in this world. But why are the traffic lights red, green, and yellow? Turns out there's a reasonable explanation for it. Before traffic lights for cars, there were traffic signals for trains. At first, railroad operators used white color to mean go, red to mean stop, and green to mean caution. But later, they realized that white wasn't such a good idea because bright white light could easily be mistaken for stars during the nighttime. So railway companies changed the white color for green to mean go and yellow to mean caution because these colors are easily distinguishable from the others. And eventually, this tradition spread to traffic lights for cars and became a standard. As for the red color, it has the longest wavelength 
which means that drivers can see it from a greater distance than other colors. And the color yellow was chosen as a caution sign because it has a slightly shorter wavelength than red, but still longer than green. What's the dustiest room in your house? Usually, the answer is a bedroom, but why? Bedrooms tend to generate dust from skin cells, dust mites, and fibers from fabrics in your bed sheets, carpets, and curtains. If you have a pet, its fur and skin cells add a significant amount of dirt to this dusty party. Luckily, there are simple ways to make your bedroom less dusty. This includes making your bed every day and cleaning the area regularly with both a vacuum cleaner and water. You can try to get rid of carpets and unnecessary furniture and decor items that tend to collect dust. Also, pay attention to the quality when you buy curtains or bed sheets. The looser the fabric, the more dirt it collects. And finally, you can ban your pet from entering the bedroom. But let's be honest, you would never do that. Modern air purifiers, air conditioners, and ceiling fans can help make your sleeping area cozier. But make sure to clean them regularly. Otherwise, if your filter is dirty or clogged up with fur or any other pollutants, it won't collect new dust properly. And the dust would end up on your bedroom surfaces. Speaking of dust, did you know that you can clean the edge of a broom with a dustpan? This zigzag over here is not only for aesthetic purposes, you can use it as a comb for the bristles. Have you ever had these marks behind your ears after wearing your glasses? Sometimes it can even take them weeks to go away. Well, it's a sign that the side pieces of the glasses, called temples, are not adjusted properly for your head. In other words, they're too tight. This can cause skin irritation and even headaches. If they're bent towards the area behind your ears, they can press on the fragile part of the skull. So, keep in mind that temples should not only have the correct size, but also correct adjustment. A professional optician can easily fix this problem. It's way safer than trying to do it on your own. Box graders can be used in a horizontal position too. In many cases, it's much more convenient to grate a carrot or a big block of cheese this way. If you want to grate a soft product like goat cheese or mozzarella, you can put them in the freezer for about 30 minutes before grating. Also, there's a way to make the cleanup easier and prevent the cheese from sticking. Spray the grater with a small amount of oil before using it. And now, let's take a look at the most unpopular sides of the box grater. Have you ever used them? This side is actually designed for slicing. It's pretty handy if you want to make thin vegetable slices for your salad or pasta. Or slice potato chips. And these tiny punched out holes are designed for zesting or very finely grating. Graters are pretty useful for the next non-food tip. If you're on a budget, you can purchase this super cheap laundry soap. Grate a small amount and throw it right into your washing machine instead of using the regular washing gel. Did you know that you can change which way the refrigerator door opens? There are hinges over here. If you attach them on the other side, the doors will swing the other way. But before trying to do any repairs by yourself, make sure to disconnect the power source and read the instructions for your particular model of the fridge. Have you ever noticed that there's a shiny side and a dull side to tinfoil? Many people believe that it matters which side is used up or down because the shiny side would trap the heat better. But in fact, it makes no difference at all. The manufacturing process makes the two sides look slightly different, but they both serve their purpose equally. Tin foil can be used not only in the kitchen. Here's a little known battery hack. Let's say you're out of AA batteries. No worries, use a smaller AAA battery and a bit of tin foil. Just insert it on one of the 